Some scarlet poppies lay upon our right. He watched them through his periscope all day. He watched then all the day, but in the night they seemed to pass away. They came again much redder with the morn, and still he gazed, and strangely longed to roam among their savage splendor in the corn, and ponder on his home. But when the charge was done, they found him there, deep in the redness, where he'd made his stand, with withered poppies in his twisted hair, and poppies in his hand. That was a poem written by an Australian soldier, Sergeant Leon Gallat, who enlisted in the 10th Battalion Australian Imperial Force in August 1914. Leon Gallat was one of the fortunate ones who made it home. He died aged 85 in 1977. In November 1914, the first Australian and New Zealand troops began their long journey to a war on the other side of the world. For many of them, Albany and the West Australian coast would be their final memory of Australia. The Speaker of the Legislative Assembly and member for Albany, the Honourable Peter Watson, talks about that unique piece of Australian history. If you happen, do have the opportunity to go there on Anzac Day, you'll see the amount of Albany people who were there, tourists who were there, and have that poignant scene at the end of the ceremony when everyone just looks out over the harbour and they have two um, sea rescue boats out there and they they fire flares over uh, from one side to the other and there's not a dry eye in the house. And to think that all those people who, you know, the last look at Australia was there, makes it a very, very poignant moment on Anzac Day. Not, not only for Albany people, but for anyone who has the opportunity to go there. We're very proud to be an Anzac town. And when, when we have the, uh, the 10 o'clock service, uh, we have all the school children march in their school uniforms. So the, the history is going to be taken through to the next generation. Um, every school in Albany, in one of the schools, Albany Grammar, they have over 600 children who march in, um, in their school uniform with a pipe band at the front. And it's very, very moving. And I, at the end of the ceremony, they all march through the, the old diggers. And we've got the Anzac Centre now up on, uh, on, Mount, on the hill where you can go along and you can put in your, your uh, relatives, grandparents, great-grandparents' name, and they'll give you all the history uh, of it. And it's, it's a tremendous innovation by not only the City of Albany, but the state and federal governments. And the amount of people have been through there since it's been in is probably double what everyone thought it would be. So the history is there and people want to see it. Australian and New Zealand servicemen and their families paid a very heavy price for their dedication to the British Empire. No family was shielded from the horror of the First World War and members of Parliament were expected to do their bit. 122 members served in the First and Second World Wars with five members serving in both. This is an honour board paying tribute to the members of the Legislative Assembly in the Parliament of Western Australia who have served in a war. It also includes three current members of this Parliament who have served in a war, Peter Tinley, Sean Lestrange and Paul Papalia. And here is a board honouring those members who served while they were a Member of Parliament. It includes John Tonkin, who went on to become Premier and is still the longest serving member of the Western Australian Parliament, 1933 to 1977. Sadly, it also includes those members who didn't come home. Bartholomew Stubbs, the member for Subiaco, became the first member of the Western Australian Parliament to be killed in action. He died in Flanders in Belgium at the Battle of Polygon Wood in September 1917. It also includes John Verdon Newton, the member for Greneff, who was killed in action over Germany in 1944 during the Second World War. He was elected to Parliament but never sworn in because he was on active service when elected. He is buried in the Hanover War Cemetery in Germany. But it was actually members of the Legislative Council who were the first members of this Parliament to serve in a war. Look at this on a board. A number of members of this House served in the Crimean War in the 1850s, the Zulu and Ashanti Wars in Africa in the 1870s, the two world wars and in all the conflicts Australia has been involved in right up until the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 70s. This is a Premier's seat. And it was from here in 1914, the then Western Australian Premier, the Honourable John Scadden, announced that Australia, and therefore Western Australia, was now at war. 
I desire to announce to the House that this morning I received from the Prime Minister the following telegram. Official information has been received that war has broken out with Germany. Signed, Joseph Cook, Prime Minister. I recognise that this crisis is probably the most critical in the history of the Empire. So far as Western Australia and Australia generally are concerned, as one of the British dominions, we are intensely loyal and will do our part in maintaining the empire and assisting the motherland. Many Australians at the time regarded themselves as Britons in exile and talked of Britain as home, even though they were born in Australia and had never stepped foot in Britain. The Legislative Council was even more effusive in its desire for Western Australians to be seen to be loyal subjects of the King. On the same day, August 5th, 1914, here in the Legislative Council, the Colonial Secretary, the Honourable John Michael Drew, moved this motion. That the Legislative Council of Western Australia in the Parliament assembled expresses its loyalty and devotion to the throne and the person of His Most Gracious Majesty the King and its determination to stand by the motherland and the empire in the present time of stress. In 1914 to 15, Western Australia was in the midst of the worst drought in memory and some believed that should be our focus and not a war on the other side of the world. Some did not want to fight what they believed was England's war. Nevertheless, barely two days after the declaration of war, the Parliament had already passed the first wartime bill. It was the Control of Trade and Wartime Bill 1914, a bill for the prevention of profiteering and hoarding by merchants. The bills followed including War Council Bill. The War Council was formed to oversee fundraising activities to benefit soldiers serving overseas and provide welfare for returning soldiers. Income Tax, War Emergency, Bill 1914. A bill to institute a broad-based income tax in Western Australia. The Enemy Contracts Annulment Bill 1915. A bill to provide a legal framework for reneging on contracts entered into with companies and individuals who were found to be connected with any of the enemy powers. One bill in particular caused a great deal of anguish for those residents of Western Australia who did not regard Britain as home. And it was the Enemy Subjects Employment Bill. The bill was designed to deny employment in both public and private sectors to anyone who was, or had been at any time, a subject of an enemy country. Per capita of population, Australia and New Zealand of all the Allied nations suffered the greatest losses. Those sacrifices did not end when the guns fell silent in 1918. The depression that engulfed the world in 1929 hit Australia and Western Australia particularly hard. Unemployment stood at 32% in 1932, and in the same year, the pensions and medical care for returned servicemen and their dependents reached a scale never before encountered. Western Australia and the world barely had time to catch its breath before, in the words of Winston Churchill, the gathering storm of war was once again about to rain down upon us. So in 1939, Australia was at war again. This is the Mitchell Freeway, named after the Western Australia Lieutenant Governor during the Second World War, Sir James Mitchell. He had also been Premier of the state. But unlike the First World War, which was fought on the other side of the world, World War II brought the war to Australia's shores and struck terror into the hearts of its people, who believed an invasion was imminent. The thought of invasion caused some people to panic and literally head for the hills. Government House, along with the Governor and Lady Mitchell, was relocated to the Kalamunda Hotel in the hills, outside Perth, as a precaution. In 1939, this was the entrance to the office of the Premier of the day, John Wilcock, and he stood to express once again the loyalty of the people of Western Australia to the King and the Empire. However, it was obvious that this new war was vastly different from all others and would be fought from the air, and that no city or town, however remote, would be immune from attack. The sinking in 1941 of HMAS Sydney off the West Australian coast, with the loss of all 645 crew, brought the war suddenly and brutally to our shores. When Broome and other towns in the northwest of the state were bombed in 1942, killing at least 88 people, it seemed that invasion was now upon us. Western Australia's vastness and isolation worked in our favour. But still, over the years, Western Australians and members of this parliament have again been asked 
to take up arms. Wars in Korea, Malaya, Indonesia, Vietnam and more recently Iraq and Afghanistan have claimed the lives and the youth of too many Western Australians. The fact that in our present parliament in 2017, three members of parliament in Western Australia have served on active duty shows that the tyranny of war is never far away.